Today we're going to move a step further in our interesting course on advanced statistics in education. Today we'll be looking at analysis, multivariate analysis of variance. Multivariate analysis of variance. MANOVA for short. Recall that last week we learned about uh, analysis of covariance, we learned about its use and uh, the mathematical model and how to use SPSS to analyze that data and interpret the report. Let's do a quick review. Uh, can somebody remind us of the assumptions that must be met before you apply the analysis of covariance? Uh, Otto, can you remind us? Yes, um, the three assumptions are, the first one is the normality of the population, and the second is the random selection, and the third one is the homogeneity of the variance. Okay, fine. So we have three assumptions, three primary assumptions that he has mentioned. Uh, you, you think it's correct? Yes. Okay, correct. very fine. Now, so let's, having met the three assumptions, primary assumptions, and we need to apply analysis of covariance in some in, in a particular setting. Now, what are the conditions under which we, we can apply the analysis of covariance? Uh, but what do you want to tell us? The basic condition is when we cannot randomly assign our population, then we now resort to an interclass, most especially in quasi-experimental design. Okay, fine. So. We have to use that classes. The school now allows us to randomly assign to experimental and control groups who are using that classes. We say analysis of covariance. What is the code there in that variance? What is the covariate? What is usually the typical covariate that we apply in uh, our educational studies? Uh, Thank you very much. Since uh, we have not been given the opportunity to uh, randomly assign our population, it becomes important for us to resort to ANCOVA. So the pretest score becomes in parity. So the pretest score of this of the sample becomes the covariate. Okay, fine. So we're using the pretest score as covariate. If we have achievement as a dependent variable, then it will be pretest of achievement as covariate of the post test. If it is attitude, we we'll take the pretest of attitude. And we'll take the post test as uh, uh, as covariate. The same thing with other dependent variables. Today we are moving on to something in my view that is quite exciting. A little bit uh, mathematically demanding, but the line principles are quite exciting, and that's uh, manoeuvre. So let's go. So what shall we be learning in this uh, lesson class? We shall be defining manoeuvre or explaining what manoeuvre is, and then we'll look at when we use it in education and more importantly how do we use it and of course there'll be a practical example at the end of this session so just before we begin let's let's look at this matter of variables we're talking about multivariate analysis of variance variate what do you mean about variable the variable issue uh, we have two major types of variables, dependent variable, independent variable. Of course, there are some uh, others in an experimental model. Dependent variables, what are they? Well, a dependent variable, like the name signifies, has a value that depends on the other. In other words, when you are having like a method of teaching, so the achievement will depend on the type of method that you are using. So achievement in this case is a dependent variable. So a dependent variable is one that represents the output or the effect. Other names for the dependent variable are response variable, regressant, explained variable, outcome variable, and output variable. What about the other one, the independent variable? Well, independent variable, as the name implies, is the one that's independent, standing alone. I mean, it, it now affects the dependent variable. So that it represents the input and is what is tested to see if it has an effect on uh, the other variable. It has other names, which are, as you can see, 
on your screen predictor variable and, and so on so we said there, there are that there are three types dependent independent and others the others are those that are not in focus in the study but you are interested in them controlling them or they're just monitoring how they affect or minimize the effect of the experiment and they are sometimes called the control variable or extraneous variable now let's go on with some example i'm taking an example from uh, the an area that a former minister of education professor Bato de Fafunwa, worked on uh, the first six-year project he, he was quite interested in the language of instruction as uh, they relate to achievement and attitude language of instruction especially the mother tongue and we are taking the example of a study which we can uh, label as effect of language of instruction on the achievement attitude to science and practical skills of basic free pupils in Lagos state as we can see there is only one independent variable language of instruction which has two levels if you like mother tongue or english and the dependent variables are achievement attitude to science and practical skills so what does multivariate mean multivariate as uh, you have multi as a uh, prefix you mean many so multivariate would mean many variables but note that this multivariate does not relate to independent variables they relate only to the dependent variables so if you have one dependent variable it is univariate if you have two or more dependent variables it is multivariate let's take two examples to illustrate this matter of multivariate let's take a, a, a study on the effects of language of instruction and and teaching experience or the achievement of basic three pupils in Lagos State. So there are two independent variables here the language of instruction and teaching experience. As you can see, there's only one, only one dependent variable, which is achievement. So the analysis that we are conducting here, recalling that it is the independent variable number that determines whether it's univariate or multivariate so the type of analysis in this case is univariate because we are looking at only one dependent variable let's take a second example effect of language of instruction on the achievement and attitude to science so effect of language of instruction that's only one independent variable number of dependent variables there are two of them achievement and attitude to science so how many what kind of analysis are we looking at here we are looking at a multivariate analysis because of course there are two dependent variables so then what's manova manova uh, is a procedure where you are comparing multivariate population means where you have as we have said all the way through this lesson two or more independent variables as a technique for assessing group differences where you have multiple dependent variables now let's compare ANOVA versus MANOVA maybe we yield to the class now to see how this goes so let's uh, look at uh, a comparison between ANOVA and uh, MANOVA Ooh, can you can you share with us uh, how do you compare ANOVA and MANOVA? Okay, uh, Shekoni. Uh, it may be possible that uh, multiple ANOVAs will not show the differences among the variables, but MANOVA will be able to do that in the form of a canonical variable or jumbo variable. Ah, yeah, you're talking about jumbo, it's jumbo salary now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, wonderful. Oh, yes. Uh... MANOVA uses the variance covariance between variables but ANOVA does not okay that's fine well done 
Yeah, so that's a very brilliant class. Um, so looking at ANOVA versus MANOVA, uh, we see that multiple, ANO multiple ANOVAs uh, will not recognize the covariation among the dependent, dependent measures, but uh, MANOVA will. As uh, Shekoni said, multiple ANOVAs will not show the differences. But MANOVA, when it comes together, when it brings together the different dependent variables into the canonical, like you said, the jumbo variable, then that, that, that can bring out these differences. Uh, MANOVA is sensitive not only to the differences in the means, but also the direction and the size of the correlations. And as uh, uh, Rita said, MANOVA uses variance covariance between variables. Whereas ANOVA, you know, uh, does not. So what are the advantages? These advantages of MANOVA derive from what we have just said. MANOVA will increase your chances for finding a group difference. That derives from what Shekone just said. And of course, it's sensitive to differences in the means. We just said this too. And it protects you against inflating the type 1 error due to multiple comparisons of uh, means. So when can we use MANOVA? We can use MANOVA when we have multiple dependent variables. We've been saying this all along through, the, uh, through this class. And when multiple univariate analysis does not give you the composite picture of the interrelationships. And of course, when we want a valid alternative to the repeated measures and over, especially when we have uh, violated the sphericity test. Now let's look at the research questions that are suitable for MANOVA. Any research question that you have at least two dependent variables in it, that one is amenable to MANOVA. Let's take two of these questions. What is the effect of language of instruction on A, achievement, B, attitude to science, and C, practical skills? As you can see from here, we have three dependent variables. So MANOVA happily jumps into the fray. The second research question is, is there a significant difference in the reading achievement? That's a dependent variable. Attitude reading, that's a dependent variable of nursery one children taught using phonics and look and see methods. So these are some research questions that MANOVA will happily be applied. What about hypothesis? Now, taking the last two research questions, the null hypothesis will be, as we have listed them here, no significant difference. We can see there are three, two or more dependent variables. There are three here. So you can apply MANOVA to test here to the same. The assumptions are like, you know, at the beginning of the class, we asked for the assumptions on the garden and of covariance or any of these parametric tests. Uh, I think it was you uh, or two. So they also apply here. Normality, because this this under parametric test, maneuver. Normality, random assignment, and homogeneity of variance. But we have some of these assumptions in greater detail, you're talking about multivariate normality, homogeneity of variance, covariance uh, matrix, linearity, multi collinearity, and singularity. As we go along during the course of this class, we'll be learning how we test for whether or not the data that you have have uh, met these assumptions or violated them. So what kind of talking about data? What kind of data can we apply? Well, the data must meet the parametric assumptions, and uh, we check compliance with uh, boxes M and Levin's test, and we should not pull together dependent variables that are highly correlated. So those are the uh, the areas where we will need to note when we are applying manual in terms of data. How much data do we need? How many cases should we have? The rule of the thumb is that you must have more participants than dependent variables. So you have two dependent variables, so the number of uh, students that you use should be more than two, but you know that is scanty. The, well, 
size that you perceive in literature is uh, like 30. So you have two dependent variables, have like 30 students in each group that you are uh, dealing with. So that's power, if the size, size of 30 will give you a power of about 80%. Uh, After all this preliminary talk about maneuver, let's see maneuver in action. As uh, we stated, maneuver involves very tough mathematics. But the underlying principles are not so tough, they are easy. Now, what does it do? What does maneuver do at the background? Like ANOVA, all it's doing is looking at variances. Uh, looking at the variances between and within. Computing canonical variate and seeing whether these differences are due to chance or real in life. The mathematical model begins with uh, maneuver creating what uh, Shikoni just told us about a jumbo variable. That's a canonical variate, which attempts to maximize the differences between the treatment groups. Now, the equation that you can see in the top bullet, W is equal to all of that, shows how the linear combinations of dependent variables uh, is achieved. Four statistics are provided when you do maneuver. Uh, the first is the Pillay's trace, Wicks lambda, second, Hotelin's trace, third, and Roy's largest root, in that order when you apply the SPSS, uh, stat uh, SPSS package. But the good news for you, uh, dear students, is that you, you do not need all of them. You just need one. And we're going to indicate when, which of them you use at particular occasions. So depending on your circumstance, you select any of these statistics. The first of them, as we said, is the Pillay stress. That's the formula for computing Pillay stress. Don't be alarmed by it uh, because yeah, it's very simple if you have, if you put in all the data, put in the data, but you don't need yourself to be doing this computation. The computer does it for you. The thing for you in this class, in this course, is to be able to appreciate the use of this formula and to be to be able to interpret what the computer, the program, SPSS, and other uh, statistical packages uh, come up with. Pillay stress is the total of your eigenvalues for the BT1 matrix. It's essentially the sum, the total of the variances accounted in the in the variance. What about the next one, Wicks lambda? Wicks lambda was uh, the the formula was uh, provided by Samuel Stanley Wilkes, uh, a renowned American mathematician uh, who lived between 19, 1906 and 1964. And uh, that's the formula for computing uh, Wicks lambda. The third is hotelling stress. Harold Hotelling came up with this formula, uh, the lowly hotelling stress. Hotelling uh, was an American mathematical statistician. Uh, the, the, it's like uh, it's very similar to Pillay stress. It's the sum of the eigenvalues and is a direct generalization of the F statistic in uh, ANOVA. The fourth and the last is Roy's largest root. This is calculated using that formula uh, by dividing largest eigenvalue by 1 plus largest eigenvalue. That's what you get in there. And in instances where the other three are not significant, Roy is significant, that's the other three uh, values. The effect should be considered, the effect of the Roy's test should be considered not significant. So, which statistic of the four are you to use? Which one will you prefer to use? Which lambda appears uh, comfortable because it's traditional choice as most widely used. Of course, different uh, statisticians will tell you why uh, they want to use one or the other. But the the the, the basis for which for for you to choose which one has to do with the evaluation that you have uh, made on the assumptions undergirding the statistic. So, uh, Pillay is, more, uh, is the most conservative uh, of the lot. Uh, Wix Lambda is, you know, traditional choice on account of it being, you know, quite uh, flexible with regard to the uh, violation of the assumption and you're not uh, committing the type 1 committing type 1 error. 
So how do you report your results when you have entered your data into SPSS? The first that it gives to you, we'll do that, I mean, you will see all of this during the practice session, is uh, a table which shows the groups. We have two groups in this case, mother tongue group, the English language group. And you can see the, you can see the number of uh, pupils, nine in the mother tongue and 11 in English. And then you, the next, the next table that it gives to you is this, which shows the intercept. Do not bother about the, this row of intercept. Be concerned with the variable for, which is the uh, independent variable of interest here. That's the group. Pillay stress is giving us 2.7. Wix Lambda, Hotelling stress, Lois, Royce largest root, giving us all of this. As you can see, they're almost all the same. They are all not significant that's the f values are all not significant meaning that our model is not applicable in 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 this case the values of uh, the four statistics are given here but if we select with lambda where weeks lambda which is 0 0.664 the f is 2.70 p is greater than 0 0.25 because p is 0 0.08 so we're not getting significant uh, Wix lambda here. But assume we get a significant Wix lambda and we come to the f values associ associated with each of the dependent variables. What do we have? We have the achievement post test. The f is 6.50. The level of significance is 0 0.02, is 0 0.02, meaning that we have a significant difference in the achievement post-test of the pupils taught primary science in basic three, in mother tongue, and in English. For the attitude test, F is 1.25, P is 0.27, which is greater than 0.05, so this is not significant, and we do not reject our null hypothesis. For particle skills, the same thing applies. P is not significant, and... Uh, we will not uh, reject will reject will not reject the null hypothesis of no difference the observed eaters or oh, that's power then okay so how do you narrate the results you narrate the results as as we have said in the last slide uh the we are saying that there's no statistically significant difference between busy one pupils who were taught science using the mother tongue and those taught in English in A achievement and all of that. Because our F118 is equal to 2.7, P is greater than 0.05. The Wix lambda that we got is 0.6 is a partial eta is uh, 0.34. Now let's look up this partial eta. It's telling us that 34% of the variation in the global score, the composite or canonical varied, is explained by the language of uh, instruction. So since we do not achieve a statistically significant result, then we will not need to perform the follow-up test. We will do that if our F-test were, were significant, and we can do that for each of the dependent variables. So to determine how these variables uh, work uh, among themselves, we need to do a test of uh, Levin and of, block, of uh, the box M test, which we did earlier though. If we had not passed the Levin's test. Passed will mean if it were not, if we were to be significant, then uh, further action will not be uh, necessary. So let's have, uh, let's go on to do a practical example in SPSS. Uh, perhaps we have some questions now, class, uh, before we proceed to the practicals. Uh, sir, I, I would like for you to enlighten us more or further on uh, when is the most appropriate time for us to conduct the postdoc test. Is it after or before the MANOVA uh, test has been conducted? And what is the importance of the postdoc test? Okay, fine. Um, maybe somebody in class will be able to answer that question. Uh, anybody? Yes, sir. Okay, that's fine. Thank you very much, Mr. Akinwalabu. You are to do that after MANOVA test because you want to know the group, the actual group that is causing the significant difference and post Oscar I mean post 
hot text is conducted to I mean to know the group that is causing the significant difference. Okay, uh, as we progress, uh, I can allow we'll be able to see uh, more. She's right. I mean, is she is she wrong? She's right. Ah, that's what you're gonna say. Okay, <laughs> she's right. But as we go along, you'll be able to get more some in depth answer to this question. All right, thank you, sir. Yeah, so let's uh, go to a practical example. The title of the study we are using as an example here is uh, we have two versions really. We have a short version Effect of Language of Instruction on Performance, Performance in Science. The longer version is Effect of Language of Instruction on Rather than have just one word performance to take the three dependent variables, we have achievement, attitude to science, and practical skills. So the two titles are correct. We can settle for either of them. Now, so what's our research question? The research question that we want to study here, that we want to, that we're inquiring, is: Is there a significant difference? In their A achievement, B attitude to science, and C practical skills of basic three people start using mother tongue as language of instruction, and those start using English. Our uh, null hypothesis derives from that. There's no significant difference in this course of the post test because we are using only the post test course uh, on account of uh, focusing on maneuver. For this lesson, the next lesson will be focusing on man cover. I'll be setting the cover rates into the equation. So we are looking at these three dependent variables for our study. So our test, because we have more than two dependent variables, is a maneuver. So how do we proceed from here? The way we proceed is we enter our data. In our case here, we have 50. We have 20 records, 20 students in uh, two groups. You can see from a variable view, we have uh, mother tongue and English language group. And uh, we have students from urban and rural locations. We have male and female students. We have students high, average, and low. So how do we proceed from here? We'll go to analyze general linear model. Recall that when we're doing analysis of covariance, we went to univariate, but now it's multivariate. So we go to multivariate, and uh, I will reset this. We have the post-test achievement as uh, one of uh, variables, achievement post-test. So you put this here. We have the attitude post-test. We have the practical skills post-test. Our fixed factor, of course, is the group, which we put here. And then we look at our model. Well, let's settle for this uh, full factorial for now. Uh, we go on to options. On options, we select these three, I mean these two. We want descriptive statistics. We want estimates of effect size. We want observed power. We want homogeneity test. And then we'll say continue. If we're looking for contrast, excuse me, if we're looking for post hoc, like uh, Akira Labu asked, uh, we're looking for post hoc on this variable. So it would be anyone that you like, they're all doing about the same thing. Bonferroni. I like uh, LSD and Shafi. So let me select them. They will say continue. And they will say OK. So we have our results. All set here. Uh, it's telling us that you cannot conduct postdoc tests because there are fewer than three groups. Fine. So because the test will just be like a t test. But let's look at the first table, which is the number of cases for group one, which is mother tongue and English here, and then the descriptive statistics for the the three dependent variables: achievement. We have mother tongue with a mean of 6.89, English language 9.09, and that, these are the so attitude post test and all of that. Now, this is the box test of equality of 
covariance. We can see that the box test is not significant, meaning, meaning that the variances are, are okay. So we are in quotes now, have passed the box test. So this looks good for us. We now come to the multivariate test where we have our four statistics Pillay stress, Wicks lambda, Hotelian stress. Uh, then we have the Levis equality of variance. We have this. Now I've tried to extract all of this table in in here by way of results so as i said earlier these are the descriptive statistics and then you have the box tests of equality of covariance matrices which is good the multivariate tests you do not bother about the intercept you focus on the variable here variable four and i've highlighted weeks lambda as you can see the value of weeks lambda is 0.719 F associated with it is 2.08, but the, the 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 value is not significant. The observed part, the eta squared, as you can see, is 0.28. That is accounting for 28% of the variance in that composite composite score. But the, if you like, the shame of it is that we do not have a significant F. So going beyond here will not be. We just fall on the the F directly. But if we are pressing on, regardless, we have the Levin's test of equality of error variance, which is also not significant, which is good. And then we have uh, the univariate Fs. For achievement post tests, as you can see, F is significant. You can see this is 0 0.02, which is less than 0 0.05. Attitude is not. Practical skills is not. After this, like the question asked, you then do a post hoc. Uh, but because these ones are not significant, doing a post hoc will not be will not yield any uh, significant meaning. If they, that is why the system did not give us a post hoc. The post hoc test, the ones we call for, the Tuki, the Bonferroni, the LSD, will tell us where the significant difference uh, lies. So, Dr. Akinola, just note that you do it after. And the meaning is for you to know where the significant difference uh, has occurred. So what conclusion can we draw from this uh, uh, study? We we'll find that there's no st statically significant difference between pupils who were taught science, using the mother tongue, and those taught in English in all these variables. Because the F associated with a weak lambda is this, and weak lambda is this, eta squared is 0.34. The null hypothesis of no difference is therefore not uh, rejected. So that is the end of our lesson. Next lesson class will be going on to uh, some other statistics associated with maneuver. Discriminant analysis, canonical variate analysis, they are all nice and exciting and uh, I'm sure you will apply this uh, during the course of your uh, study. The assignment for this lesson is for you to now take on any of the other independent variables, I leave it to you to select either gender or school, socioeconomic status and then run a maneuver through it and uh, arrive at some uh, conclusion. So that's it class. See you next lesson.